So I talk about the youth and I talk about everybody else, but I want to go to Acts 20. Acts 20. This is real good. Acts 20. And I got my professor in the building. Uh, Dr. Craig Burris was away. He was having some relaxed time celebrating his mom. And I called on the doctor. And he gave me some information. So since he's in the building, I get a chance to work some of his stuff that he gave me. And we'll go from there. But in Acts chapter 20, starting at verse 7. On the first day of the week, we came together to break bread. Paul spoke to the people. And because he intended to leave the next day, he kept talking until midnight. There were many lamps in the upstairs room where he were meeting. Seated in the window was a young man named Eusiphus, who was sinking into a deep sleep as Paul talked on and on and on. When he was sound asleep, he fell to the ground from the third story and was picked up dead. Paul went down, threw himself on the young man and put his arms around him and told everybody, don't be alarmed, he said, he's alive. Then he went upstairs again and broke bread and ate after talking until daylight he left. The people, they took the young man home alive and were greatly excited about it. Somebody say, stay woke. Tiffany Adams was this young lady who happened to be on a, a plane a few days before June 19th, 2019. She thought she was having a bad dream. On the last Sunday of June, last Sunday on June 23rd, she found out that the Air Canada the crew had left her on the plane sleep. Nobody was on the plane but her. She was asleep. And she woke up startled and scared and didn't know what to do. She went into the place where the pilots be and she tried to grab the walkie-talkies so she could talk to somebody. This is just a few days ago now. And she couldn't get a hold of nobody, and she got the flashlight, and she started flashing to see if somebody could see her. Nobody saw her, and then she decided, oh my, this, this is like a horror movie. And she went to where the plane door opened, and she opened the door, and she waved her hand. And somehow or another, the ground crew came and got her, and then Air Canada sent her a message and says, do you want a limo and a hotel room? She said, no. Are you all right? She says, no. She went to sleep. She didn't stay woke. It's amazing how many people in here, when you drive, you go to sleep. Oh, just me. It's amazing when you're driving a car and somebody on the other side say, are you awake? And you be driving and they be looking at you, are, are you really awake? And you be like, yeah, I'm awake, I'm awake. Yeah, I'm awake. According to the National Highway of Traffic Safety Administration, every 100,000 police reports, there is 1,550 fatalities that deals with driving while asleep. 71,000 are people that just get injured, but there are 36,000 that actually die. I need somebody in here to say, stay woke. Here are four reasons people fall asleep in church. You ready? They love God. They love God so much that they bring, they, they take their medication and they come to church and they know their medication going to put them to sleep, but they rather be in church going to sleep than to be at home and miss church. Okay, here's another one. They are out of gas. Whew. Whatever happened yesterday, 
Whatever happened this morning, they are tired. And they come in church and they be so tired to let go. And then they'll say amen when, when the pastor says, and we are praying for Jay's family who's in bereavement. Amen. Everybody look, you sure? Then the preacher, number three, rocks us to sleep. Number four, people forget in church we are the audience. You ever been to church and you be saying, say amen, be like, people go to sleep in church. I'm getting there now. But in Acts chapter 20, verse 8 and 9, so there were many lamps upstairs. And upstairs sat this young man in the window. And because Paul had been preaching over and over and long and long, he went to sleep and he fell to his death. Wow. Dr. Heiss would say, if I were to fall three stories, there would be a crushed skull, broken bones, horrible inside damage, as well as on my way to the cemetery. You remember this. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a what? All the king horses, all the king men, they couldn't do what? Now some would say this was just an egg. Others would say it was this big old cannon. And this cannon fell and hit the ground and they couldn't use it no more. But Mother Goose had us all thinking it was an egg. But no matter what it was, when it fell, it did what? It broke. And it could not be put back together again. Well, here is Paul. You just heard Dr. Heiss just, I shared with you what he said. He said, if he were to fall three stories, I guess I would need Jeff to tell me if this would be three stories. If you fell from up there and hit the ground, you would be messed up for life. Think about it. Not, not that commercial, I've fallen and I can't get up. Don't come with that. You will be messed up for life. But Paul, Paul did something different. Paul went and laid on top of the young man. And Paul said, he's alive. Well, huh. like Paul, just like Paul who laid on this young man who I believe his skull was busted. Arms had to be twisted. Come on now, somebody. He, he, he didn't know. He was asleep. He hit the ground. He splattered, right? All this stuff should be messed up. Dr. Heiss comes back again and give me another theory. He says, I have no doubt that such things happen and are possible but are mostly for far removed from his experience of life. And then he goes on to say, this is where he dropped a nugget in my life that changed me. He did have a friend who had a healing done. His friend arm was broken from football. He went to a healing tent, went to a service jokingly like, ain't nothing gonna happen, he went there. And when he arrived, the healer pointed out to him and his friend, Dr. Ralph Heiss' friend, Professor Heiss' friend. Yeah, I want to make sure you got that understanding. Was healed. He felt his bone that was broke come back into place. And everybody else that was there that was looking for healing, they didn't get served. But this one who didn't believe got served. Kind of remind me of when I was stabbed in the eye in 1973. My grandparents was told I would never, ever use the right eye ever again 
it was going to give me a glass eye. And once they gave it to me, I was never to do anything because if I was loud, I would have migraines. If I ran and played sports, anything would happen, I would be messed up. And they told my grandmother, even if we give him a glass eye, at the age of 50, he will have glaucoma and it will spread to his left eye and he will be blind for the rest of his life. Wow. Right there. I didn't believe that God could do anything. I was so unsure he could show up till I laughed it off until I realized if you take a glass eye out, you can put it in, right? And what would my friends say? And that's when I called on something that I thought was a God, that I thought would show up, that I thought would intervene. And it seems like in the, in the room, like a cloud filled the room. And I went into what I call a deep sleep. And when I woke up, I had a patch on my eye. And I had 12 stitches, 3, 6, 9, 12, holding my pupil in my head. I was one of those that didn't believe in donating anything for my body, but somebody donate me a retina. Somebody donated me a lens. And they put it in, and they sold it so it wouldn't fall out, but they said I couldn't do nothing. So I ended up, I ended up, being in the hospital for months and months. Little did I know, the same God that healed Dr. Hyde's friend was working on my eye. So they came in and they said, we want to see where the stitches is. And the nurse said to the doctor, and the doctor said to the nurse, there's no stitches there anymore. She said, well, how is his eye staying in the head? Did we put the glass eye? No, we did not. Well, what is going on in his head? Because there's no stitches, and it looks like, it looks like he only can see the, from the bottom. But how can he see from the bottom if he was stabbed directly in his pupil? And they have a conversation. And my grandmother over here talking about, I know the Lord will make a way. Yes, he will. My grandmother over in this corner. And when they pull everything back, and they say, take it to the left, take it to the right, they say, okay, so you won't sing. You won't play ball. You won't do nothing. Because it's going to fall out. This is, this, is, this is a miracle. Nothing like this ever happens. Nothing like this can ever, ever happen. And I was sitting in the Caramel House, and they were singing. And, and the lady was like, I don't know who we're going to have hit this note, but we need this note done. And I started singing it from back there, and my grandmother was walking up. She was so mad. She was so angry. She was so upset because she knew my eye was going to fall out my head, and I was going to be messed up for life. And she was so worried. And she was, I kept telling her, I said, I saw... God heal me. I saw God heal me. Which takes me to where I am. This is the best part of the service. Excuse me, Jeff. This is a fork. Few people know about the fork. Only a few. The fork. Anytime you go to a good restaurant, it's always sitting up at the top of the plate because that's for your dessert. The fork lets you know the best is yet to come. See, see, whether you like peace cobbler, cheesecake, you know, whether you like uh, a German chocolate cake, whether you like, whatever you, you know, it's, it's that fork. It sits up in front. And, and most restaurants will say, please keep your fork. 
And if you at mama's house or nana's house, she'd say, don't throw that fork in the sink. That's your dessert. And when I think about the best is yet to come, I take this fork and I always remind myself that no matter what you go through in life, the best, okay, do this for me. Okay, this is good. Act like you're eating your best dessert. There you go, watch your face. Was that good? Wait, wait, one more. One more piece, one more piece, one more piece, one more piece. One more time. One more piece, I want you to really taste it. Now, when you taste it this time, I want you to say to yourself, you ain't got to let me see it because I'll see it on your face. Ready? Here we go. At the age of 62. I feel like I'm still 45. I get up every morning at 4 a.m. I get on the treadmill for a half hour. I do what I do all day. Sometimes I go to bed at 11 o'clock at night, but I get back up at 4. Somebody say, what's going to happen when you need some more rest? What's going to happen when you need rest? I look at my wife. <laughs> Get back up. I say, well, what are you going to do now? I say, I'm going to drive Uber, Uber, Lyft. You ain't doing that. No, I'm not. But I'm at a point now where I've done well. I feel good about me. And, and, and this great church have sown some seed in me that will cause me to do stuff all over this city like never before. When, when you hear my name, you turn around and say, he come from us. That's good stock. That's from First Baptist Church of Greater Cleveland. You, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you, don't, you don't you don't have to worry about me somewhere in a corner calling you out, putting your name down or whatever. I got too much going on in life to even think about that. But when you hear my name, and I promise you, if you just do a little research, you already were here, but you ain't done it yet. When you start doing it, you'll know I'm part of the stock. I was one of those that had a miracle done in my life. So I'm going to deposit a miracle in your life. To Pastor Craig, who I believe, as long as I'm on this earth, will be my father in the Lord. And I honor you. Can you give him a hand, please? I honor you. to this praise team. Hey, I love you. Like, sister and brotherly love, like always. To my brother, who had been with me every step of the way, when he go with me and he play, they be like, who is that white boy? What, what he going to do? I can play for you. I'm like, no, no, no. He, he can't play. And when he get through playing, everybody's standing there spellbound. And I say, he's not a white boy. That's my brother. His late mom, his dad took me in as their family. Nothing. I mean, him and his wife will stop doing something, let me come over to their house, and let me just be as loud as I want to be. And then she'd be like, is Jay going home yet? 
Demetrius. Demetrius is not just any type of bass player. He's a, one of the best bass players, I believe, in this world. Demetrius. Tony, his family, not just Tony, his family loved me. And Tony, I appreciate you. Even, I appreciate you, man. Thank you so much. Yeah. Brian, I talked about your daughter. Were you here? I'm on my way. I'm done. The young people, if I needed something that I lost, I could count on Olivia to help me find it. Olivia will go out of her way. She see me almost in tears looking for something that was real personal. And she kept trying to find out what it was. I wouldn't tell her, but she kept saying, I'm going to look for it. We turned all the garbage cans over. My grandbaby took it and put it in the garbage. We didn't even know it. And Livy just looking at me like, what is it? What is it? I will never, ever stop loving the young people of First Baptist Church. Amen. Can we give our young people a great hand? Well, Y'all come on. We'll finish out. Jeff Gordon. I had to learn Jeff, and Jeff had to learn me. And I'm, not, I'm talking about in this way, where we both come up on two different sides of the world. I do things out the box. Jeff do them A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Oh, H, I, J, it takes a moment when I say, Jeff, we ain't got to do all that. He'd be like, K-L-M-N, all the way to the letter of the law. This church has taught me accountability. This church has taught me responsibility. Whatever I do, the one thing that I have that the average person on this earth will never have is 12 years of training at First Baptist Church of Greater Cleveland. I have some, uh, yeah, I had some good days, had some bad days. But guess what? Where the Lord has me at today, all that training works. I wish I had some witness. So we're going to close with this. This is my favorite song of all times. And I, I leave with this. Thank you for the... I, I've never had a plaque, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, that's cool, you know. I've done a lot of things, man. I probably, if you all could actually see my bio that goes out before I go out, you would be startled. But when you get home to do something for you, when you get home to do something that has never, that you've never gotten, all those other awards that I have at home, I mean, I had so many in the office, I threw them away because I got so many at home. I got unbelievable, right? But to have this right here from the church, it supersedes all the other awards that I ever got this year. And I'm probably at 26 already. This is the biggest one for me. And... Uh, I would cherish this. I probably would move some stuff out the way. My wife's going to be telling me, put all that stuff in, the, in your office and get it out of the living room. But this is very special to me because this is from home. This is from home. 